so glad that you're joining us online today. We just love you, and uh, please worship with us this morning. Jesus. Amazing grace, how 
Jesus, we adore you, oh God. We worship you this morning, Lord God. We give you all the praise, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. We're filled with your wonder, Lord God. We're awestruck, Lord Jesus, in your wonder, Lord God. We just worship you this morning. Lord God, things are different. Things are are crazy right now, but Lord God, we, we promise to give you all the praise. We promise to give you all the glory, Lord God. Lord Jesus, this morning as, as Pastor Peter brings your word, Lord God, I just pray that you would just be with him. Lord God, lead him, guide him by your spirit, Lord Jesus. Anybody who's listening right now, Lord God, that you would prepare their hearts for change, Lord God. Prepare their hearts for what you would have for each and every one of them. Lord God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory this morning. In your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. As we have already worshipped in our singing at Willowdale PC, we also worship through our giving. And we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available and it's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website, willowdalepc.com, and click on the giving tab in the right hand side. And under push pay, click give here and you can give any amount. Just follow the simple instructions to give. It'll take you less than two minutes and it's a very secure way to make your donation. For those who don't have access to the internet, please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings here at the church in the office mail slot by the front door. God bless you and thank you for your faithful giving.
Hey Willard LPC family, I'm Rashawn and I'm going to bring you some of the announcements for this December. So this December, we want to invite you guys to join us on our website, Facebook, and YouTube for our Sunday service. Although gathering looks different now, we still want to invite you guys to this experience with amazing worship and a powerful message. We'll be broadcasting at 5 p.m. every Sunday, so make sure you tune in. Well, it's that time of year again, and we are super stoked for Christmas at Willowdale PC. And so if you're super stoked for it too, make sure you tune in on Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock, YouTube, Facebook, and our website for our special Christmas Eve service. We are so excited to celebrate this season with you guys, and we want you guys to log on and be part of this amazing experience. So we cannot wait to see you on this Christmas Eve. Well, that's all the announcements we have for you guys today. So let's lean in and prepare our hearts for God's Word today. What is Advent? Advent means coming, and during the Christmas season, Christians prepare for Jesus' coming. Advent candles shine brightly in the midst of darkness, representing and reminding us that Jesus came as light into our dark world. A new candle is lit on each of the four Sundays before Christmas. Each candle represents something different. The things we get for Christmas will not last as long as the things we get from Christmas. We'll finish our Christmas treats, get bored with our Christmas toys, and grow out of our Christmas clothes. But the things we get from Christ this Christmas and always, hope, peace, joy, and love will go with us all our life. Why do we like the Advent candles? The first Advent candle is the candle of the prophet. It stands for hope. Jesus is our hope. He died on the cross to save us and gives us everlasting life. The light of hope shines in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. We light this candle for hope. The second candle is the candle of John the Baptist, who remembers Isaiah's prophecy of peace. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our peace. His peace is deep within us, reaches out to friends and strangers, and brings justice to, the, to our world. We light this candle for peace. Dear God, thank you that even when there is no special star in the sky or angels singing, there's a real sense of your peace within us at Christmas time. Thank you that you're always with us sharing in our good and bad times and giving us your peace. Amen. Praise God. I think it's very fitting that uh, the Advent Candle this week talks about peace. <clears throat> and uh, our church family Oh, are leaning so much on the peace of God this week. Uh, this past week, we've got some very tragic news. And if you haven't heard already, on November the 30th, uh, Jade Kenya Minyara went to be with her Savior after suffering a stroke. Uh, and uh, if you don't know exactly who that is, she is one of our global workers that we support here at Willowdale PC. So our family feels it in that way. But also, um, she is Blake and Christine, Pastor Blake and Christine's daughter, uh, their firstborn. She was 32 years old. She is survived by Julius, Ezra, Gabriel, and Josiah. <laughs> and uh, we just want to pray for them. I just ask you and implore you to continue to pray for them for the peace of God that would come and, and comfort them. Uh, tomorrow, Pastor Blake and Christine will be leaving to go to Kenya. 
understandably so. They're going to be uh, on an extended bereavement leave. Uh, we will keep you very much up to date uh, with what is going on in their lives. Uh, you can find on our social media posts and through our email blasts uh, the information. You may want to find out about the funeral and the memorials. Uh, but today, I just ask you to keep your pastors in your prayers. Uh, keep them in your prayers for safe travel, but, but of course, for, for the loss, Lord, they're uh, feeling such a great loss, the entire family. Um, and so today, <coughs> we, uh, we join them in that loss, and we lift them up, and we support them as a family of God. Let's just take a moment and pray right now for the family. Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. <clears throat> Father, um, it's been a, a trying week, to say the least, oh God. But Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jade's life. We thank you, Lord, that it is still affecting the kingdom of God today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the testimonies we're hearing of how her life and her ministry and her testimony is still affecting the lives of those around her, O oh God, or those who were in her realm of influence, Lord Jesus. So we praise you and thank you for that today. Father, protect our pastors, Pastor Blake and Christine, as they travel. I pray that you would help them, Lord, in this difficult time. Be with Julius, Ezra, Gabriel, and Josiah. Lord, be with them. Encourage them. Let your comfort be felt around about them, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Praise God. I thank God today for his faithfulness. I thank God um, that we have a blessed hope. And uh, today we, we, we hold to that. Amen. And uh, I want to get into the word today. And I think our, the word is a timely word. And I just want to open it up to you and pray that it, it encourages you, it challenges you, and it, and it pushes you closer to God. Uh, the title of my sermon today is A Trustworthy Saying. I'm just thinking, have you ever had a friend say to you, listen, this is super important. I mean, like, you need to really listen to this. And then after you, you heard what they had to say, you listen really intently because you're like, wow. You're thinking to yourself, man, that really wasn't all that important. I don't know what the big deal was. And conversely, have you ever been in a situation where someone has really important news to you? I mean, important enough that they should have interrupted whatever, th whatever you're doing and told you and, and, and came in and expressed this truth to you. It's like a son, you know, talking to a mom on the phone and talking about their everyday life and everything that's going on in their life, you know, about, you know, what they have for supper, the restaurants they've been to, how the kids are doing and, and how you're doing and, and just shooting the breeze, you know, what shows, what series are, are you watching, you know, and then all of a sudden, just before you go to hang up the phone, you go, oh, by the way, mom, I got engaged, bye, and then hang up. Or, okay, mom, by the way, you know, um, we're going to have a baby. You're going to be a grandma. Bye-bye and hang, and hang up. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would survive such a phone call with my mother. <laughs> I think my mother would be quite upset if I, if I gave her such information that way. And uh, just to let you know, Carrie and I um, did not tell <laughs> my mom that uh, those, those important things in our life that way. No, we'd pr probably say something like, Mom, I have something really important to tell you. Then you have set her heart and her imagine, imagination on fire, you know, set them up for, for the great news you have in store for her. And so she's waiting, you know, kind of with bated breath. What do you have to tell me, son? Paul's letters, I mean, just to look at the letters, I mean, you could dig in them and dig in them and dig in them your whole life and never get all the truth and all the richness out of these letters. They're all very important I would tell anyone to pay attention to every word written in them. But when Paul tells us specifically within these letters to pay particular attention to what he is saying in certain circumstances, I think we should. There are a few phrases uh, that Paul uses throughout his letters that would make us sharpen our senses all the more to what we are about to read. One of these phrases, and, you, and a phrase you're going to hear a little bit later today when we gather around the, the Lord's table together, and I thank God that we can still do that, even though we're part, you're in your home or you're here. Uh, we can still partake of the Lord's Supper together and feel that fellowship, thanks to the Holy Spirit. But one of those phrases that Paul uses more than once is, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. 
You find it in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 uh, with the passage that we use during communion time. And you also find it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses, verse 3. And uh, both these passages are, are actually, you know, most likely creeds that were used in the church. It's something that, that Paul was encouraging them to repeat over and over, use again in, in worship over and over in the church. And uh, they tend to be very old pieces of, of Scripture. I know 1 Corinthians 15 um, is one of the oldest chapters in all of the New Testament, one of the very first recorded. There is a second lesser known phrase that I want to I want to focus on a little bit more this morning. And it's very simply, here is a trustworthy saying. This phrase can be found in several places in Paul's letter, particularly when he's writing to Timothy. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. But you can find it in 1 Timothy 3, 1, 1 Timothy 4, 9, Titus 3 and 8, 1 Timothy 1, 15, as well as 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13, which we're going to focus on a little bit more a little later. All highlighting principles and teachings we must pay particular attention to. For instance, in 1 Timothy 1, 15, it says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. I would like to focus on one of these trustworthy sayings or a series of trustworthy statements really found in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. If I was to focus on all of them, that would be a full sermon series. But I just, I just want to dig into this passage a little bit more this morning. And so this will be our text. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 13. It says this, Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Father, I pray that you would apply this word to our heart today, O oh God, that I would be a vessel, that the primary communicator today would be your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and the word, Lord, which we read. I just pray that you would uh, give me clarity of thought and speech as I present your word. And that we do it with the power and authority, O oh God, that you've given me to do this today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we find four couplets. <coughs> Excuse me. Four couplets that Paul wants us to pay particular attention to. Four really conditional statements that he wants us to pay particular attention to. If we go back to the beginning of chapter 2, Paul says these words to Timothy, and I think they're very important to set the context for, for which these words are written. And uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 in First Timothy, um, it says this. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul is mentoring, he's discipling Timothy. And he is encouraging Timothy to be a mentor and a disciple maker himself. And this in and of itself is a lesson that we need to all take, is that, you know, I believe that we need to be discipled and we need to be discipling. And you say, well, I, I'm not really equipped to be a disciple maker. I think you are. I think you are with how you live in front of your children and how you live in front of your coworkers. When they look at you and they see the love of Jesus Christ in your heart, you are discipling them. You are teaching them. And Paul had a specific discipling, mentoring relationship with Timothy. And it is in this context that he writes these words. As part of this mentoring process, Paul highlights things. Uh, he says with the phrase, here is a trustworthy saying. And I think he does this for the benefit of Timothy and others that he is mentoring. So let's take a look at these four couplets, these four conditional statements that Paul was using to teach his young disciple today. The first one is, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we die with him, we will also live with him. Romans 6, 8-11 to says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. 
In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 3 and 4 says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. What an amazing promise. There is some debate as to whether uh, this phrase in, in Timothy refers to the threat of martyrdom or if it is a reference to baptism in water and the spiritual life we obtain through salvation. I think both are true. Um, if we die in Christ or for Christ because of our faith, as many have, then we will also live with him in eternity. What an amazing truth. William Barclay said this. He says, Jesus Christ cannot vouch in eternity for a person who has refused to have anything to do with him. But he is forever true to the person who, however much he has failed, has tried to be true to him. He is forever true to the person who, however much he has failed, has tried to be true to him. I don't know if you take as much comfort from that as I do today. If we die for our faith, we can guarantee he will be our advocate in eternity, thus ensuring our place with him. But what we do here and now in time matters. What we do in this life matters. The second understanding which I am more inclined towards is the, in this instance is the death to our old life. The understanding that when we accept Christ, we put our old life to death apart from Christ. And the new life we experience with him upon salvation, when we accept the Holy Spirit into our hearts and he changes us. We share in Christ's death on the cross when we experience the death of our old selves apart from Christ. And we identify with Christ's resurrection because our whole understanding of life and purpose changes when Christ enters the equation. We are a new creation. We are made new in his sight. This is a beautiful transformation we celebrate when we publicly declare our decision to follow Christ through baptism in water. When we get baptized in water, we, we represent this. When we go down into water, it represents the death of our old life. And when we come up from the water, it, it represents being washed, being made new in Jesus Christ. And it's a public declaration to say that I am new. I was dead, but I am now alive. What an amazing truth. This is why water baptisms is one of my favorite things to be a part of as a pastor. We are displaying to any onlooker and to the world that we died with him and now we live with and for him. This trustworthy saying should cause us to take inventory this morning and I want you to focus on this and ask yourself this morning, am I living a life that displays this miraculous transformation to the world on a daily basis? Am I living a life that puts on display this miraculous transformation to the world on a daily basis? Do I live a life that people can look at me? Maybe those who knew me before I became a Christian, they can look at me now and say, man, what happened to them? What kind of transformation, what happened to them that they have had such a 180 turn in this life? And I hope that that gives you an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. I agree, I agree with Paul and say that this is a trustworthy saying, which would indicate to me that this is something that I should regularly take inventory in my life. It's something that I should pay attention. And I ask myself, am I living like this? Am I living? Do I show people that I have died to my sin and that I am alive in Christ? If this is true for my life, can people see it? Can they tell that I, am a, that I am spiritually alive? The second phrase Paul includes as a trustworthy saying is this. He says, if we endure, we will also reign with him in verse 12. The Greek for endure here is in the present tense and it infers a continuous action, to continually endure. Our identification with Christ reminds us of our eternity. It reminds us that we can live a full life in Christ here on earth, thriving in his kingdom. It also reminds us that it will not always be celebrations, miracles, and smooth coasting. Life in Christ, although the only eternal rewarding path will present its share of difficulties, and it is not easy on times, and we've experienced that this last week. 
with the loss of a dear friend and a daughter and a mom. And I'm encouraged by the testimonies that I'm hearing of her life and how it's affected people and how Jay's life is still affecting people in the kingdom of God today. I've heard testimonies of at least three people have given their heart to the Lord because of the testimony, because of, of, of the example of Jay's life that was left behind. Praise God. And I believe that her testimony and her life will continue to affect people. And so we understand that if we endure we will also reign with him. We understand that, you know, if we endure tough times. Have you ever taken on a challenge with great intentions but didn't follow through? You didn't follow through with it. you like, you know, like all these fad diets. Sometimes, I got to be honest, I feel like the growing in the shrinking man. And obviously, I'm not the shrinking man right now. I have seasons that I endure through the temptations, you know, and do well with my weight and, and manage to stay out of the fridge when I shouldn't be in there and other times where I have not endured and have to go back to my big guy clothes in the back of the closet. And people say, well, you should get rid of those. Well, then that would just be expensive now, wouldn't it? I don't look at something, life as something I endure. I mean, yeah, I have little struggles like my weight and we endure these things and we struggle with these things. But I don't look at my life as something that I endure. I love this life and I'm thankful for it. However, we have to endure many things in this life from sickness, financial struggles, tragedy, and more specifically to what Paul is talking about here, persecution. We don't know persecution like some parts of the world know persecution today. Matthew 10, says, You will be hated by everyone because... Of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Can you imagine hearing these words of the disciple? You'll be hated by everybody because of me. It is clear that we are in a pluralistic world. We're in a pluralistic society, and persecution for being in a singular understanding of eternity is going to increase. We're going to see an increase in this persecution over time. We can trust that if we endure the hardships of life that includes persecution, then we will reign with him. We have an eternal perspective. We're thinking eternally here. We're not thinking about the, the, the momentary struggles that we, de- that we live. We, we look beyond that. We look for eternity. This is why we endure, because we're going to spend eternity with our Savior. The third, the third phrase Paul includes as a trustworthy saying here. Is in verse 12 as well. It says, if we disown him, he will also disown us. Not quite as uplifting as the other two, but true and trustworthy nonetheless. I've, I've made a discipline to myself that if I read something in Scripture I don't like, that doesn't mean I skip over it. <laughs> if I le- read something in Scripture that makes me kind of look at it and say, ouch, that hurt a little, I don't want to skip over it. I want to dig into it a little more, and I want to see how it's going to shape me and change me. So dig into this with me for a moment, will you? In some translations, you will see the word deny here instead of the less popular disown, where deny means declare untrue, assert the contrary. Disown means to refuse to acknowledge and accept as one's own. This is a difficult passage because it seems to infer that people would believe there is a God intellectually and spiritually and still willingly walk away and refuse to acknowledge him. And to be honest, my heart aches at the possibility that someone could be so confused that this is, a, that this is actually something that can happen. It makes my heart hurt. It makes me ache at the thought of this. We come across people who deny Christ all the time. The common reasoning for for such a denial in the world today, they say a lot of times, is a lack of evidence. And many atheists, in fact, suggest that they are open to proof of God. If there was proof, they would acknowledge Him. However, one cannot limit their defense of the existence of God to just natural proofs. Although I believe there are plenty, but that is a sermon for another day. I think we need to understand that faith is involved. Whenever I have got into debates with people about creation versus evolution and other things, I always uh, preface the debate, I always preface the discussion to say, where is your involvement with faith in this discussion? Do you acknowledge faith? And people sometimes say, well, no, I don't. But some of the greatest 
uh, if I could use that term, atheists in the world today, some of the things that they believe, they believe that there's a 100% chance that there is extraterrestrial life. And I say, well, how is that not involve faith? Where is your evidence for such a thing? Of course, there's faith on both sides of the argument. And I try to make people understand that there is faith involved. There's faith involved in this discussion, and we, n- we must pay attention to it. For instance, I would assert that the world is full of complexity, and that the smaller we look into biology, into macro, into micro, and even macro levels, we find a greater and a greater and a greater complexity, which is completely opposite to what evolution would propose. This is true. This is true. Everybody, in, everybody who's ever studied macrobiology could, could attest to this. I would say that uh, such a realization is evidence of an intelligent designer. But also from the natural, tangible proof, we cannot ignore the supernatural. And that's just one evidence. There's, there's many natural proofs that I can get into that I believe that could uh, uh, prove the existence of God. And, and you don't have to look any, more, any farther even than Romans 1.20 that talks about his invisible characteristics that leaves us without excuse. And I would love to, at some point to be able to get into some of those and just uh, dig into the natural proofs for God in another sermon. But today I want you to think about the supernatural. Yes, there is natural proof for God, but we need to acknowledge the supernatural, and that requires, requires faith. Can we naturally prove the, the splitting of the Red Sea? What about the swallowing of Jonah by a great fish? Or how about Elijah's ascension into heaven in a whirlwind? If any of us view these things today, we would be lost in a fantastic bewilderment. Yes, we can describe and explain naturally how Jesus died. But can you explain his resurrection without the supernatural? Can you explain to me how Jesus Christ, who was dead, rose from that grave? Can you explain the natural understanding of that without the supernatural? The thought that people can look at natural evidence of God in this world and still walk away is unbelievable to me. It is unbelievable to me. Everywhere I see, I see his fingerprints. Everywhere I go, I see the natural evidence for God. But the thought that someone can experience the supernatural presence of God and do the same is beyond me. This trustworthy saying should light a fire in us to be able to defend and to share our faith. It should light a fire into us to, to, to persevere in our faith, to dig deeper into the Word, to dig deeper into this world and see the natural evidences of God, but also to acknowledge the supernatural presence of God in our life. When I see this phrase, yes, it's a bit difficult. If, he, if we disown Him, He'll disown us. It's a hard one to... To take in, but it should spur us on. It should spur us on to choose God, to examine this amazing world he's created, this amazing universe he's created, and be open to seeing the natural evidences and experiencing the supernatural evidences of our creator. The last part of these, super, these uh, trustworthy sayings says this, if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. When I read this at first, I just said, thank you, Jesus. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The Greek word for faithless is in the present tense, again, represents a continuing state of refusing to believe in Jesus or obey him. If you're continually faithless, just think about that. If you're continually faithless, God is still faithful to you. And I invite you to explore that understanding. God remains faithful despite our faithlessness. There are countless examples of God's faithfulness in this world, in Scripture. He remains faithful and sustains us in spite of our behavior on times. The reality is that much of this world remains faithless. 
The Psalms are full of writings asking God why the faithless seem to prosper. You don't need to go any farther than Psalm 73 where Asaph struggles with the question. And he couldn't understand why the faithless, those who didn't believe in God, were prospering. And he didn't understand everything that was going on in his life. And then he gets to verse 17 and I, I ask you to go read it yourself in Psalm 73. And he says, until I entered the sanctuary of God, I did not understand their destiny. Did not understand their eternity. Psalms are full of writings asking God why the faithless seem to prosper. However, this is not what I choose to focus on today. Where I choose to focus is that God's faithfulness cannot be shaken. God's faithfulness cannot be be shaken. God is not changeable. He is unchangeable. He is immutable. You cannot change his faithfulness because of your faithless faithlessness. All through the prophets, we see the Israelites being warned over and over and over again that the Babylonians and the Assyrians are coming to destroy the nation for their unfaithfulness. But as we read through these prophets time and time again, we see the words, but if you repent and return to me, then he would stop the impending de disaster. If you repent and you return to me, he says, I will stop the impending disaster. And Nineveh and Jonah is proof of, of this faithfulness. They were wicked. They were wicked. Go read how they describe the, the Ninevites. But upon repentance, God was faithful to his word. He saved the city. Even though Jonah wasn't too happy about it. And sometimes we get that way. We get like Asaph and we say, why is the faithless prospering? Why does everything seem to be going well? And I've even uttered the words out of my mouth sometimes. And I even uttered them to my mom not re just recently. I says, why does it feel like sometimes things just can't come a little easier? Why can't things just go a little simpler? But you know what? I endure. I persevere. Because God is faithful no matter what. God has a plan. And yes, I may struggle with things. I may have questions in my own mind. I may go through times in my life where, I, where people might describe it as faithless. But God is faithful. God remains faithful. And I trust him. And I thank God that no matter how much I mess up, he will still love me. He will still provide for me. He will still provide for my family. No matter how far gone you may think you are, he still loves you. He is still faithful to you. Let's just take a look around and think about the things that you still have God to thank for. He sustains the world. It says in, first, in Colossians, I believe, that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world and he sustains the world. We have so many reasons to be thankful for God. He is faithful even when we are not. Have you ever felt like you deserve to be deserted by God? Have you ever felt like, man, I've messed up so much, I don't know why you stick around? No matter how far you feel you are from God, no matter how far you feel you are from God, He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful and He will accept you back home. He will accept you back home. I love the story of, of, of uh, the prodigal son, and we focus so much uh, on the son coming home and how gracious the father is, and of course, but we forget sometimes about the older son who was in the back, who was supposed to represent us in the church, you know, those who are faithful, you know, and he's looking at the father, and he's, he's complaining, he says, I've been faithful to you, I've never left you, why do you celebrate this man, why are we going to kill the fatted calf and have a party for this guy who's been faithless, who's left? who squandered all you've given him. And all the father could say, but he's home. He's home. He's home. All the father wants you to do is come home. You may feel faithless. You may feel like you don't deserve his love, but you do deserve his love because he took that upon the cross for your sins. He took your, he took your sins upon the cross so that you could turn back to him. And that you could embrace the faithfulness of God in your life. And I'm going to tell you, he's faithful to you right now. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's still faithful to you. 
But when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be able to be able to acknowledge that faithfulness in your life. You're going to be able to see it. And you're going to say, thank you, Jesus, for the food I eat. Thank you, Jesus, for the home I live in. Thank you, Jesus, for the gas I put in my car. Thank you, Jesus, for the friends I have. Thank you, Jesus, for the family I enjoy. Thank you, Jesus, for this new uh, church family you've let me be a part of. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to be able to see the faithfulness of God. You're going to be able to acknowledge it. And I thank God that at our most faithless times in life, he is still faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No no matter how far you feel you are from God, he is faithful. And he is waiting for you to come home. Matthew 5, 45 says, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. I don't like passages like this so much. You know, we want all the sunlight. I don't know what it is about Christians sometimes, why we think it's such a bad thing that God blesses those who don't serve him. He says he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But I pray today if maybe you fall in yourself in that category that you maybe haven't acknowledged the faithfulness of God in your own life, whether you're a believer or not, that I would implore you today to acknowledge the faithfulness of God in your life. Begin to thank him for what he's done for you. Let his faithfulness draw you back home. Let his faithfulness draw you back home. These are some trustworthy sayings. These are some trustworthy sayings. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure the hardships, whether persecution or otherwise, we will reign with him. Praise God. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Two very positive statements and two, to be honest, very difficult statements. But all are true and trustworthy and all can teach us today. All can disciple us today and and remind us of the faithfulness of God. I hope today that you have chosen to live in him and to endure what he, whatever, for the sake, for his sake, pardon me, because if so, eternity with him awaits and we cannot even begin to fathom what that's going to look like. Maybe you find yourself faithless today and maybe even angry at God because of your life circumstances. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you say, I'm not going to come back to the church until God changes my situation. I ask you to take your step towards God first. Let him open your eyes to see what he's already done for you. He loves you. He loves you. His faithfulness is all around you. He loves you. Take note of how he has remained faithful to you. He is patient with you. He still blesses you in spite of your faithlessness. It doesn't matter what you have been through in your life. He can still help you live a joyful, fulfilled life full of grace and mercy so that even when the world may wonder why you persevere, they may wonder why you bother, the love and the promises of God prove true in your life. These are trustworthy sayings. Be alive in Christ. Stay the course. Our endurance will provide the greatest of rewards. Pay attention to the reality of God in his creation and in the supernatural. I believe that the miracles are meant to be a part of our life. And if you, uh, you know, uh, maybe the supernatural is something, you know, I can't go there. Well, ask God to show up in your life. Ask him. Maybe you need a miracle today. Ask him. In the name of Jesus, ask him. With faith in your heart, believe for that miracle today. And I'll believe with you. Remain faithful. But if you do struggle, and we all do on times, if you do struggle, don't beat yourself up. Be reminded today of the grace and the mercy of God. Be reminded today that he is always faithful. He is always faithful. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because of the faithfulness of God. Because he walks through the valley of the shadow of death with you. 
Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, every time I preach, every time I prepare a sermon on God, God, I pray that it speaks to me as loud as it speaks to anybody else, oh God. And so today I take these words and I challenge myself. And Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you have challenged others through these words, oh God, that these words would mentor others, Lord, and disciple others, just like Paul intended to disciple Timothy, Lord Jesus, that they would speak into the lives of each and every one of our situations and remind us of the faithfulness of God. Today, Lord Jesus, if there's anybody that have not accepted the Lord as their Savior, I pray that you would speak to their heart today, that wherever they are, whether they're in their living room, listening in their car, wherever they may be, oh God, that they would take the time right now and just say, Lord, can't be faithless any longer. Help me see your faithfulness. Come into my life, Lord. I've sinned. Change me. Make me new, Lord. I want to be alive in you, Lord. I want to die to this old sin, and I want to live alive in you, Lord Jesus. Speak to my heart today. And if you invite him into your heart, I encourage you today to tell somebody, Father, we just pray that you would speak to them, that you would bring someone across their path, that they could tell that, you've, that they've accepted you into their heart. Lord Jesus, we love you today. Father, you are faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that great is thy faithfulness. We love you today. We honor you, Lord, as we move now, Lord, into communion time. And remember how you died on the cross for our sins, Lord Jesus. We're reminded today of your faithfulness. So, Lord, be with us as we partake of this Lord's Supper together, that we would feel the harmony and the unity of the Holy Spirit wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me. If you have your Bibles wherever you are, you can turn with me to, to uh, 1 Corinthians. I mentioned some other statements that Paul repeated. Um, and I want to read a couple of them for you today. The 1 Corinthians 15. Beginning at verse 3, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is a trustworthy saying. <laughs> for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Amen. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen. And that he appeared to Kepha and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and the last of all, he appeared to me, also as one abnormally born. What an amazing passage. You want to talk about natural proofs. Here's a, an amazing historical uh, account of, of a passage of Scripture that would have been repeated regularly in the church. They would have memorized it, repeated it regularly in the church, and it's believed that this was recorded as early as 15 years after the passing, the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. If we go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we go to this familiar passage that we read so often, and I implore you today that if this becomes real, ritualistic to you, to take this passage phrase by phrase and live it in your life and think about it today and meditate on it today. <coughs> Excuse me. Beginning at verse 23 in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim 
the Lord's death until he comes. I ask you to prepare your emblems. I don't know what that looks like today. When we were home during the lockdown, my goodness, we used grape juice at home. We even took a bit of food coloring and colored a bit of apple juice. <laughs> but we gathered together and we partook of the Lord's Supper together. And we felt the harmony and we felt the unity of the Holy Spirit in doing so. Today, I want you to take this bread, wherever it is, whatever it looks like, if you've got a cracker or a piece of bread, whatever it looks like, wherever you are, just break it with me. Remember his broken body. Remember how he was beaten. He was bruised. Father, I thank you for this small wafer, Lord, and thank you for what it represents in our life. Thank you for what you endured for our sake. You endured for our sake. You endured this for our eternity. You endured this, oh God, so that you could be the first fr uh, fruits from the grave, but that, Lord, we would also, Lord, experience resurrection into life, oh God, that we would also experience, Lord, eternity with you. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that this represents. Thank you for enduring the beating that you had, you had taken, oh God. So, Lord, we remember you today. Bless this emblem as we partake together in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. And we have this cup. We say we are washed in the blood and we are made white as snow. And I mean, if you're thinking about that literally today, that sounds kind of strange to you, I'm certain. But what it means is because his blood was shed on the cross, it represented him taking our sins upon the cross. And when his blood was shed, our blood didn't have to be shed so that our sins could be made white as snow, that the sin that was in us, we were all born, it says in scripture, shaped in iniquity. And that sin that was within us was made brand new, clean, gone. As far as the east is from the west, he, he made a way because his blood shed, because he shed blood instead of us having to shed our own blood for our own sins. He took our sins upon the cross for him. His blood being shed has made us white as snow. So today, we remember that. We remember that by his stripes we are healed. And we can ask him today. If you feel something in your body, that you've been struggling with, you can say today with faith, Jesus, I need a healing. Jesus, I need a healing. So we remember how he hung on the cross and even on the cross, the graciousness that he expressed to the other criminal that was on the cross next to him, inviting him into to eternity with him that day. What an amazing thing that this man, this God who was broken, beaten, obliterated on the cross, probably struggling for every breath that he was taking, maybe couldn't see through his eyes, was obliterated on the cross. He could have looked at the man and said, don't bother me, I got enough going on. But even then, he said, yeah, I can take your sin too. And today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So this cup represents our righteousness because of him. Because he shed the blood for us. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that today we hold this cup, O oh God. And this is a cup, Lord, that we can bear. Lord, if we had to bear the cup that you bore that day, oh God, it would be a different story. But Lord, you allowed us to bear this cup, oh God, instead. And you took all of sin upon yourself. And today we remember, Lord Jesus, that it is be because of your shed blood that we can stand here, made righteous in your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of a cup together today. 
Thank you, Jesus. My sins are gone. I am made new. Amen. Father, Lord, as we close our service today, there's a lot, Lord Jesus, that we could digest, I hope, Lord, from this sermon today. There's a lot for us to contemplate, Lord Jesus, as we gather in this table together, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that, that you have spoken to us, that, Lord, across geographical lines, oh God, that we have sensed your presence together as a family. Lord, we certainly look forward to, to gathering together as a body again, Lord Jesus, where we can see this room filled again, Lord Jesus. We look forward to that time. But, Father, I thank you for the fellowship of the Spirit. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are bound by the Spirit. The seal of your new covenant lives within us, Lord Jesus, and we can sense your presence today, Lord, no matter where we are. We sense your divine unity today, O oh God, no matter where you are. So, Father, be blessed today. Be glorified by your people. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray you would bless this church family this week. Again, Lord, be with the Davidsons as they travel. Be with the Kenyon and Yars and the Davidsons, oh God, as they mourn, Lord Jesus. Let them sense your presence through it all. Let them sense the great comfort of our God. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Go with us now as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the written word, the spoken word, and the living word this morning. We thank you for the reminder that even when we turn our backs on you, you do not give up on us. You remain faithful. We thank you that you forgive all our sins and heal our diseases. You redeem our lives from the pit and you pour out your love and compassion on us. Help us today to be totally surrendered to you, to stay the course, to endure the challenges ahead of us, and to be faithful. Help us not to lose our focus on you, but to concentrate on you and be true to you. Today we pray for our city and those who are hurting. We pray for the leaders of government that you will give them the wisdom they need to lead in these challenging times. We pray for all our essential workers and ask your protection upon them. We pray for those who are bereaved, but you will bring comfort through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you, the source of hope, will fill us completely with joy and peace and that we will be confident through the power of the Holy Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.